this is a short presentation about how to include non-randomized studies in a network meta-analysis. Consider a systematic review aiming to compare the efficacy or safety of many interventions and that the network meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials is deemed appropriate. If you don't know what a network meta-analysis is, I encourage you to watch a 10 minutes video on YouTube. Although randomized controlled trials are considered the most reliable source of information, their strictly experimental setting and inclusion criteria may limit their ability to predict results in real-world clinical practice. Therefore, researchers might be interested considering non-randomized studies for their systematic review. By non-randomized studies, we mean observational studies, like cohort studies or case control studies, clinical controlled trials, registries, and routinely collected data. Systematic reviewers are often reluctant to include non-randomized studies because their risk of bias is typically higher than the risk of bias in a randomized study. Tools like Robins, developed by members of the Cochrane Collaboration, can be used to assess the risk of bias in a non-randomized study. Non-randomized studies are often large, and hence, their very precise but potentially biased estimates will influence a lot the summary effect of a meta-analysis. There is one additional consideration when data from non-randomized studies are to be included in a network meta-analysis. The assumption of transitivity might be difficult to defend because randomized and non-randomized studies often differ in settings and participants' characteristics. Consider we are interested in comparing the efficacy of 15 antipsychotics in patients diagnosed with schizophrenia. Leucht and colleagues identified 168 trials that compared these interventions and synthesized them via network meta-analysis to obtain a treatment hierarchy and estimate all relative treatment effects. The primary efficacy outcome was the improvement in symptom scale and was measured using the standardized mean difference. Subsequently to the publication of this systematic review, we obtained access to data from a large cohort study that involved 11,000 participants and compared five active antipsychotics. Because of confidentiality agreements with a company that provided data on the non-randomized study, the names of the drugs will be anonymized for the rest of the presentation. We propose a four-step approach that could help researchers include such non-randomized evidence into a network of randomized studies. Before starting the process, investigators should have already considered whether the inclusion of non-randomized studies is desirable. Including a non-randomized study into the network might boost the precision of scarce evidence and provide direct evidence for some treatment comparisons for which only indirect evidence is available. It can also improve connectivity by linking disconnected networks. On the other hand, registration of non-randomized studies is not compulsory and therefore the risk of publication bias and selective reporting might be high. Considerable resources need to be invested to ensure that all relevant non-randomized studies have been identified and their risk of bias evaluated. The first step in the process is to obtain estimates on relative treatment effects from each non-randomized study. To attenuate the bias in the treatment effects introduced by the lack of randomization, several adjustment methods are possible. Regression models and the use of propensity scores are the most popular options to reduce the impact of unbalanced effect modifiers within a non-randomized study. The availability of individual patient data would improve flexibility and enable systematic reviewers to address any shortcomings in the original analysis of a non-randomized study. Randomized controlled trials and non-randomized studies will probably have differences in inclusion criteria, settings, methods, etc. You can try to minimize differences by including covariates in a network meta-regression model. You might detect discrepancies between direct, 
and indirect evidence, which is related to the notion of subtle inconsistency, or between randomized evidence and non-randomized evidence for the same comparison. These are the summary effects for the comparison drug 4 versus drug 15 and drug 4 versus drug 6. Its line corresponds to the summary effect using a different source of evidence. For the 4 versus 15 comparison, we observe some disagreement between the indirect randomized evidence and the direct randomized or non-randomized evidence. For the 4 versus 6 comparison, there is some disagreement between non-randomized evidence and randomized direct or indirect evidence. Differences between the sources of evidence were much smaller for the other treatment comparisons in the network. What should be done when differences between randomized and non-randomized studies are found? Investigators should look for the sources of this disagreement and evaluate the comparability of effect modifiers between the various sources of evidence. A network meta-regression model, ideally with individual patient data, could improve agreement. What if the discrepancies between the randomized and the non-randomized studies are small and remain even after adjusting for covariates? We think that Instead of discarding non-randomized studies, it is better to include them and explore the impact of various degrees of credibility attached to them. When we have randomized evidence, here in blue, and we mix it with non-randomized, we probably get something more precise, but potentially more biased. Three approaches can be used to combine various study designs accounting for the fact that non-randomized evidence might be less trustworthy. We assume that the randomized studies provide an unbiased estimate of the relative treatment effect represented here by the dashed line. Then, we shift the non-randomized evidence with a pre-specified bias adjustment parameter beta. Because of concerns about non-randomized studies being over-precise, we can reduce the precision by dividing the variance of the estimates with a parameter W. Then, we can synthesize the two pieces of evidence, but now non-randomized studies will have less influence on the summary effects and bias would have hopefully decreased. What I just described is the design-adjusted analysis. Each study is evaluated separately and according to its characteristics, we need to set values for beta and W. By changing the value of W, researchers can control the amount of confidence they want to place to a specific non-randomized study. Values of W close to 1 mean that results from non-randomized studies are taken at face value. If we set W close to zero, then that particular non-randomized study would contribute no evidence to meta-analysis. Of course, pinpointing exact values for beta and W is difficult, and a sensitivity analysis using a range of possible values is advisable. Instead of trying a range of values for beta and W, we can assign a distribution to the beta parameter that includes some uncertainty reflected by sigma. This will naturally downweight the non-randomized study and further downweighting using W is not needed. We applied the design-adjusted analysis in our schizophrenia data. We set beta equal to zero, assuming that we don't expect bias in the single non-randomized study but we have some uncertainty about the exact magnitude and direction of bias. This uncertainty is reflected on parameter W. The plot presents the standardized mean differences for the comparison of drugs 4 and 6 for different values of the W parameter. The results for this drug comparison appear to be robust to the different levels of confidence placed in the non-randomized study. The second approach is to perform the analysis within a Bayesian framework where the non-randomized studies are used to form an informative prior distribution for the relative treatment effects. 
The prior is then combined with likelihood of non-randomized studies into a posterior distribution. The prior from the non-randomized studies can be again adjusted for bias, and the influence it has in the final result can be controlled with a parameter w. This is achieved by dividing the variance of the prior distribution by w if the distribution is normal. An equivalent approach would be to raise the likelihood function of the non-randomized studies into a power alpha and then use it as a prior in the analysis. In the example of antipsychotics, we use the likelihood of the single non-randomized study to form a prior which was then combined with the randomized control trials. We discounted the impact of the non-randomized study by using different values of alpha. Larger values of alpha place more confidence to the non-randomized study. Because we fit the model within a Bayesian framework, alpha can be assigned a distribution rather than a single value or a range of values. The summary treatment effect seems to remain unchanged to the various distributions for alpha, and hence the conclusions for the relative effect of drug 4 versus drug 6 are not sensitive to the amount of confidence placed to the observational study. The third approach to synthesize data from various randomized and non-randomized studies is the three-level hierarchical model. This model requires data from a variety of study designs. Consider that randomized studies control non-randomized trials, cohort studies and case control studies are available and they all try to answer the same question about the relative efficacy or acceptability of interventions. At the first level of the hierarchical model, we estimate the effect sizes within each study. At the second level, we synthesize the data for each design separately. The design-specific heterogeneities, denoted with tau, reflect the variability in the true treatment effects within each design. At the final level, we synthesize data across study designs. The final heterogeneity parameter, tau0, captures the variability in treatment effects across the different study designs. The synthesis of data at each of the two levels can be done with network meta-analysis or simple pairwise meta-analysis. This depends on whether the assumption of consistency is expected to hold within each design or across designs. The design-adjusted approach and the prior approach are probably useful in most applications. However, they require values for bias and precision adjustment, that's beta and w, and this might be difficult to obtain. A sensitivity analysis using a range of values is advised. If the model is fit within a Bayesian framework, assigning a distribution to the bias parameter is probably the most sensible approach. This work will be presented in an article by Eftimiu and colleagues, which is currently under revision.